Please be seated and Madam Sash Garrett for doing a great job last week. <laughs> and he up north and minister to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for the kind words. Thank you, Gary and Jan. Very nice. We're in Galatians chapter 3, and uh, I think I had quite a bit listed there, but we're not going to go that far to relax. Put your fans away until we go home. <laughs> um, I thought you'd enjoy that now that it's fall. You would. <laughs> uh, look, we've been working through uh, Galatians, that Paul wrote the letter to the church in Galatians. And uh, he was, uh, the church was, had uh, gone away from the, the basic fact that salvation is by faith only not by works, not anything else added to it, not adding, subtracting, and doing other things. And Paul's been dealing with this uh, situation. Uh, the last few uh, weeks we've been helping him going through that. And it's a matter of, uh, the issue is, becomes about the fact that they were trying, the Judaizers were coming in, and they were trying to add things to uh, become a Christian. You had to become a Jew, basically, and then you would be able to do all the uh, rituals, all that sort of thing. And Paul said, though, no, that's not the scripture. The scripture is that salvation is by faith and faith alone. And so this has been the, uh, the battle that's been going on. We talked a couple weeks ago about uh, Paul wrote about that I've been crucified with Christ, and no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in his flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And really that's who we are, we're people that have been crucified with Christ, crucified with, with Christ, and that we're no longer living in the flesh. And that's the challenge that we have every day when we get up in the morning. Are we going to live by faith, or are we going to trust the flesh? And uh, we talked about the, the argument from experience in, in chapter 3 at the start, where the Galatians were uh, considered they had to be all these sort of things that were fooling them. And then by the law or by faith? Are you going to live by the law or by faith? And the reality is we cannot live by the law. The law is a guidance for us. It's a good guiding force, but it's not. We can't live by that because none of us, none of us can uh, keep the law. And then he talked about from Abraham. And then in verse uh, uh, 14, well, verse 15, we're going to start. In 14, it said, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So we see this idea of that, uh, that Abraham, in his relationship with God, is the one who got that. And he says in verse 15, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has not been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to the two seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the, right inherit, for if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Uh, so here's what happened. He said, you're trying to say, he said, I speak to you in human terms. And, and man's covenant, when we make a covenant, we have to have two signatures. We have to have the signature of the person that, uh, if you go to the bank and borrow money, they have their signature and your signature. There's a covenant. You have to, you have, to have a mediator in between the two. And, and Paul says that in Abraham's covenant, there is no mediator. The promises were made and spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He, chose, he does not say and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. So Abraham says, with the covenant that's made that God makes with Abraham, it was a one-sided covenant. God said, I'm going to keep it. He promised these things. And, they, and it's going to be carried out in your seed. Now, the seed, in this case, is Christ. He's the one that he's speaking for. That's who the covenant. Who's the one who's going to pay the price, ultimately, so that we can be in relationship with God the Father. This isn't something just conjured up when Christ was uh, born at Christmas and all that business. This goes 
back to the very beginning of time, the beginning of eternity, that God had a plan to, to bring together those that uh, want to be in his relationship with him to have a way to do it, and that's through the seed of Abraham. Not seeds, but seed, and that seed is Jesus Christ. And so this is one of the problems, that's Christ. What I'm saying to this, uh, the law, which came 430 years uh, later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to nullify the promise. So God gave Moses, and he, gave, he went up and he gave them the covenant, he gave them the law. They came down, and the covenant was between God and man, and the, and the angels that were there, and they brought that down. But it did not nullify the covenant that God made when he was uh, when he went in amongst the, the, the uh, animals that had been slaughtered, and he gave the promise, a one-sided covenant to, uh, to uh, uh, Abraham. He goes on to say, uh, but for if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God is granted to Abraham by the means of a promise. So then we see in 19 and 20, why the law, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. So the mediator, the angels mediated between uh, Moses and God. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. The mediator is not just for one party, but for both parties. And so we see again in 19 and 20, so why the law then? That's the question. It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. And the, and the covenant was made with Abraham in Genesis 15, 18. Genesis 15, 18. And as you go back, you see that when, when he, uh, let me just read back there, you don't have to click over there, but 15, 18, and I actually read 17 as well, but uh, 15, 17, and it came about when the sin, sun had set, and there was very dark, and uh, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. Remember, in the story, God, they had the, uh, the sacrifices all laid out there. And Abraham and they, God came. And on that day, in eight, uh, 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river as far to the great river as the, as the river Euphrates. He's given this. He made the covenant. Abraham was sleeping. And God, the covenant was made by God, and he'll be kept by God, and he, he does not break his promises. The law came to expose uh, people to the fact that they can't keep the law, and that as a matter of fact, they, they were in a position where for it would be very, it was difficult. So God, in this covenant, said that there will be a seed, the seed, which is Christ. And for, in verse 18, for if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, on a promise, but God has granted to Abraham by means of a promise. I wanted to share with you uh, from William Barclay, who's a commentator. Uh, he has a really good piece on this, so I want you to. How do we know that a person is justified by faith alone? Because God gave his covenant or inheritance by promise, not by law. We're, we know that we're, he's going to keep his promise because it, it, it is his promise. And we're justified by faith because God promised that he would do it. He didn't say, here's the law and you're going to keep it. Most of us can't keep the law. I can prove that too right now. When you leave here and the speed limit's 45, how fast are you going to go? I know, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> we can't keep the law. That's the, really, that's the whole point there. But here's what Barclay sums up this passage. Uh, again and again, Paul comes back to the same point. The whole problem of human life is to get into a right relationship with God. So long as we're afraid of God, so long as God is a grim stranger, there can be no peace in life. How can we achieve this, this right relationship? Shall we try to achieve it by a meticulous and even self-torturing obedience to the law? By performing endless deeds, by observing every smallest regulation the, li the law lays down? If we take that way, uh, we are forever in default. 
If we try to live by the law and not by grace, we are always, always in default. We can never fulfill the law. And so we, we see, uh, again, the turmoil that we see around us, that not only here locally, but na nationally and around the world, the turmoil comes from a result of the lack of peace, not having someone, a peace giver, Christ, in their lives. So we see that. We, we are always under that pressure um, of following the law. I, don't, I haven't really told anybody this, but, um, so don't tell me this. <laughs> um, coming back from uh, Michigan last, uh, in August, um, in Georgia, my new famous favorite state, uh, in Georgia, just north of Atlanta, all day in Michigan, the speed limit is 75 miles an hour on the inter on I-75. They moved it up, very smart people. Um, <laughs> then in, in Indiana, I come down that way, Indiana, it's like 70, 65, 70. So I'm coming down in Georgia, and it's like, I guess it was, I thought it was 70. But anyway, I got to the outer band of Atlanta, and uh, a lot of people go off the other side, there's five lanes, just beautiful. And I have, I always drive with my uh, car set on cruise pretty much always in 78. Because usually the, my brother who's a cop said, they'll give you eight miles an hour. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm too along on the outside lane, have a good time. My wife's probably talking, I'm not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. But anyway, um, all of a sudden I see these blue lights in my back. That's odd. Because uh, I don't break the law. I'm always real straight. But it didn't go away. <laughs> so I pull off to the side on the left side. And then he tutored his horn and said, Go over that way. And then I'm sorry to cross five lanes. And on the other side, he was flashing behind me. And he came up and he said, Are going in a hurry? I said, Not really. I'm just trying to get home. He said, well, you're going 80 and a 55. I said, 55. I guess right after you go around the, where the band or on the uh, Atlanta is, I guess once it gets to be five lanes, instead of staying 70, they put down to 55. Hmm. You like to travel? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I, I didn't. I just, so when he gave me the details, I said, well, he wrote the ticket, I think. <laughs> what can you do? I mean, he had me. I was breaking the law. It's one hundred sixty-seven dollars to pay that. Needed that. What? No, no, I paid it. I already took care of Georgia, so it's <laughs> So then I get a letter from a couple of different lawyers that says he got a ticket and uh, we'll help you fight the ticket. And I'm thinking, how can I fight the ticket? <laughs> this, the speed limit was fifty-five. I was going 78, and they said 80, but I know I wasn't because I always said it was 78. But anyway, I didn't argue with him because he had like this dad, and didn't look good to me. <laughs> but when, then I, we took off again, the cop took off, or he let me take off one or the other, but so I went back up to 78, and my wife, of course, <laughs> I don't have to tell you what she said. So. <laughs> Here's even what you say, and we're knowing what we're gonna, you're going to say. So, anyway, I was breaking the law. I got fined. It was stressful. It's never fun having a cop come up here. Well, I wanted to stand on my wife's side. That was a big thing. I didn't really have to look him in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to say that we all break the law. I don't care who you think you are. We all break the law. And that's the problem with the law. It's a, it's a guide for us. We're supposed to be within that. But if we didn't have the law, we didn't, wouldn't know that we're breaking the law, then we wouldn't know that we need a savior. Get the picture? Did that picture. But my savior was like the attorney, but he didn't really save me much. What? Well, I need a savior? So anyway, uh, so we're forever in the for man's imperfection can never fully satisfy the perfection of God. We are forever frustrated, forever climbing up a hill in which the peak never comes in sight, uh, forever under condemnation. But if we simply abandon this hopeless struggle and bring ourselves and our sin to God, 
then the grace of God opens its arms to us and we are at peace with God who is no longer judge but father. He's no longer our judge but he's our father. If we can just set aside the pride, if we can just set aside all the stuff about us and turn our lives over to Christ, we're set free. We, be, we receive a peace that passes understanding. And even in the most difficult crises, crisis, we still have the peace as we go through uh, go through uh, our our life. He says, uh, opens his arms to us, and we're at peace with God. There's no longer judge but Papa and a father. Paul's whole argument is that is what happened to Abraham. It was on the basis that God's covenant with Abraham was made, and nothing that came in later can change the covenant any more than anything can alter the will that has already been ratified and signed. So God made a promise. The promise continues on from the time of the, given to Abraham until the time that you and I pass from life unto life into the arms of God. But we need to be willing to set aside self and we need to be, consider the reality of the fact that God loves us and he wants not to be our judge, but he wants to be our father. What an amazing God we serve. Think about that. He wants to set aside all the stuff that we've done because we've come to Christ and Christ has washed us clean. He's covered us with his blood. And we are now in relationship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are comforted in the midst of whatever, whatever our life brings upon us. Whatever opportunities God gives us, whatever struggles God gives us, he's there with us. What a great encouragement that should be uh, as we go through the struggles of, of daily life. My friend Bill Apple, I talked to him a couple weeks ago, and Bill's had a very hard time. He's got six months to a year to live. He said, I'm struggling. He said, I used to be, a, I used to, he's a pastor. He used to say, I used to be on the other side. I said, well, Bill, you're on the other side. No, I'm on the other side, so let's chat. But he, but he said, Tom, it's just, it's just a lot. I said, Bill, think about this. The things that are, are positive. First of all, you know the Lord. That's good. Your wife knows the Lord. That's good. Your children know the Lord. That's good. Your grandchildren know the Lord. That's all good. The whole family. I said, as you go in for the treatment, somebody's going to come and they took a had a video of him getting one of the shots or something. Kind of weird video. Facebook, you're probably the most everything. Um, and I said, Bill, you're going to meet nurses, doctors. You're going to meet all kinds of people. You're going to have an opportunity to share Christ with them in the midst of a struggle. And I said, you're going down to Boston, he went to Boston to the top, he got a point with the top, uh, my wife's not here, she can't tell you what kind of leukemia, but it's in the bone. It's real, it's not good, it's bad. You gotta meet with the top guy, and you can hold the top guy even above him, that's God, Jesus. You have an opportunity to spread the love of Christ in all the places that you go. He would never be able to go there if he didn't have a key man. And he wouldn't go there, he wouldn't have any reason. But now God has opened up an opportunity, a path for him to be able to share the love of God. God, not the God that judges, but the God that's the Father on an almost daily basis with people he would never would have met. What a great opportunity we have to be able to, as we go through the struggles of life, as we go through the good things of life, we have an opportunity and oftentimes it's the struggles that puts us in places that we would have never been if it hadn't been for that. I, I, I think back of with Jean, she was, we went through all this time with her cancer, of the first cancer that she'd given five years to live. We, we met people and when God healed her, the doctor that diagnosed her, first of all, with the liver cancer and said she would die in two years, he came back and once the surgery was done with a different doctor, but he did go into the room and check it. He came back three times in the, in the first day, and she, he looked at the chart and it said no cancer. And he put it down and he left. And he could not believe, he could not believe that uh, he was wrong and that God had taken over. We, we have opportunities every day, yeah. and mostly through our struggles, but even when it's through the good times, are we really remembering the promise? that God gave to Abraham, that he was going to send the seed. That seed is Christ. And if we come to know Christ in a personal way, we are washed clean. We are then in relationship 
God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we live our life not as being judged, but as being fathered by God Himself. I pray, I pray that you take the opportunities to share the gospel as you move through your life. Don't sit, don't beat people over the head. You don't have to do that. You need to live your life and tell them about how God, how God loves you. And he loves them. This week, I challenge you this week. I tell you, challenge you to make a point. Make a point in the things that you do. To take an opportunity and to tell people, to tell people how God has protected you and how God has preserved you and how God loves them as well as you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have was, uh, to gather together and to share in the gospel share in the scriptures. Father, we appreciate just the opportunity that we have to, to live out each day glorifying you. And Father, help us. Give us a nudge when we get on the wrong path. Or give us a little bit of an encouragement as we uh, step in the right direction to share, to share the gospel, to share Christ with others. And help us to understand that you called us to go into all the world. You called us to make a difference in other people's lives. And so help us, Father, to be able to tell people that I love God with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength. And I love my neighbor and myself. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing together uh, just a closer walk with me.
Let it be a great time of fellowship, getting to know one another. And we just give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.